This is going to be <coughs> the first of a series of three lectures in which I'll describe my joint work with Professor Andre Neves. from Imperial College. Oh, I'm speaking in English, so maybe I should speak in English. Uh, UK. Uh, last week I gave a, a, a general talk about that. The, uh, the idea is that in these three lectures I'll try to explain the details of this, this work. So this is some uh, work on the variational theory for the area functional for surfaces in the three sphere, surfaces of any genus. Uh, and as a consequence of this variational analysis, we are able to get a proof of the Wilmer conjecture that uses the Mimax theory of minimal surfaces. Uh, I explained uh, the main ideas last week again. So here, here's how I, I have organized Uh, these lectures. Uh, so today I'll talk about this family which I denoted by sigma vt, the five parameters. So this is the starting point of the whole construction, right? To any given uh, closed surface in the three sphere, we can associate naturally a five dimensional family of subsets of the three sphere and we have a natural bound for the area of those guys in terms of the Wilmer energy of sigma. So here is where, so the goal of today is to explain the, well, describe the family and to talk about the blow up and the degree arguments. Uh, that I mentioned last week. So in the second, talk, I'll describe the Mimax theory. I'll talk about Mimax for the area of functional. And particularly, I will describe what I mean by the Almgren-Pitts Mimax theory. Right. Uh, and finally, in the third talk, I'll talk about the proofs. Theorems. Right. Right. So today I'll, I'll talk about the blow up and degree arguments. The topological argument that I mentioned in the end, I'll, I'll leave it to the end for the for the final for the final talk. And in the middle, I'll describe uh, this <coughs> this theory of Mimax of minimal surfaces. Okay. So 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 that's the idea. So. Today uh, we're going to study this family, and we have to do we, we have to do some calculations. So, so this is an explicit family of surfaces, and we need to analyze the behavior of the surfaces uh, as the parameters go to the boundary of the parameter space. We need to fix the lack of continuity, and then we need to to detect the genus of the original surface uh, somehow in the family. So so let sigma be. Oh, so let me warn you that uh, this talk might last, you know, a little bit more than one hour, something between one hour and one hour and a half, okay? Uh, so sigma is going to be an embedded closed genus G surface contained in the three spheres, smooth, right? Then we define uh, the following functional over sigma. It's just the integral of 1 plus h square. h, the mean curvature of sigma. And this is the so-called Wilmer energy of the surface sigma city inside S3. So, of course, the Wilmer problem is conformally invariant. So, if you, if you bring your surface back to R3, you get the usual... Wilmer energy, which is just integral of mean curvature squared. So, but the point of view that we, we adopt here is to look at the problem as a problem for surfaces in the three sphere. 
So if you consider any conformal map of the three sphere, the Wilmer energy has this remarkable property that it's conformally invariant. So the Wilmer energy of the image of the surface under F is just equal to the uh, Wilmer energy of the original surface. And a way of seeing that is just realizing that if you integrate 1 plus h square, right, and you just expand this expression in terms of the principal curvatures, remember that the mean curvature is just the average of the principal curvatures. So you see that this is the same as integrating k1 minus k2 square divided by 4 plus 1 plus k1 times k2 over the surface. This is just an algebraic uh, calculation. And you see that from Gauss equation, 1 plus the product of the principal curvatures is just the intrinsic Gauss curvature of the original surface. This Gauss curvature. Right? So in the end, you get the integral of the Gauss curvature, which, which is 2 pi times the Euler characteristic of your surface, plus the integral of this quantity, which is uh, exactly one half of the integral of the square norm of the trace-free second fundamental form. Right? Again, this is just a calculation. It turns out that this quantity, if you, if you multiply this square norm by the area of your surface, this is a conformally invariant quantity, pointwise. Okay? So this is a way of saying that the uh, Wilmer energy is actually conformally invariant. So let me just remind you of what the theorem A is. Uh, so we have uh, an embedded closed genus G surface of the three sphere, and we proved then that if the genus is at least one, the Wilmer energy of sigma will be greater than or equal to two pi square, right? And the quality characterizes the Clifford torus. So moreover, this is going to be equal to two pi square if and only if sigma is the Clifford torus. which is defined as S1 times S1 in the three sphere up to the action of the conformal group. So up to conformal group. Right, so the Clifford torus minimizes the Wilmer energy among the class of all surfaces of genus G greater than or equal to one. That's the, the theorem A. So of course, if the, if the mean curvature is zero, we get a characterization of the Clifford torus in terms of its area. Again, considered inside the full space of minimal surfaces of genus greater than or equal to one. So let me introduce some notation. So everything here is going to be very explicit, so we need to, to introduce notation. So I'll denote by B4. Uh, the open unit ball. Okay. So S3 is just the boundary of B4. And I'm going to look at a uh, ball. I'm going to use the following notation for balls inside R4. So this is just a set of points in R4 such that the distance of X to Q is equal to R. This is actually the notation that we use in the paper. Uh, if, we, if I don't write the 4 up here, I just mean the, the intrinsic ball in S3. It might be a little bit confusing, but let me just stick to the notation of the paper. If I don't write the 4, this is just the set of points in S3. Maybe I should write different notation here. Search that the distance of x to q is equal to r, but this is the spherical. distance. Okay? Uh, so then for each, for each, each vector v in the unit ball, 
the open unipole, I can define the following conformal map, Fv, which goes from S3 to S3. This is going to be conformal map. Defined by the following, following expression. So Fv of x is just equal to 1 minus normal v square divided by this minus v. So this is the expression. It's very easy to see that this is conformal, right? This term over here, for example, is an inversion. Then you multiply by something and you subtract something. So this is a conformal map. And you can actually check that it sends uh, the sphere into the, into the sphere. So what is it doing? Well, you can see that if V converts to a point in, the, in S3, right? you can see that this map is going to send everything in the three sphere to minus P except the, the point P itself. So FV of X converts to minus P for every X different from P, right? Because if V goes to S3, the, its norm is going to 1. So this guy is vanishing. This maybe has a singularity when X is equal to P, right? But if X is not P, then this term is going to 0, and everything is sent then to, to minus P. Q is a point in R4. Sorry, yeah, you're right. This is less than R. Right. Thanks. Yeah, this is the ball. The open ball. The open ball, yeah. So we have this whole family of conformal transformations of S3 parametrized by a vector in the unit ball uh, B4. One can see that Fv fixes the points plus or minus V divided by normal V if V is different from zero, right? F0 is just the identity map. So geometrically, what it's doing, uh, Fv is a, what we call a center dilation. So if you, if you draw a picture of the sphere, and here is V divided by normal V. Let's say here is minus V divided by, by normal V. Then your map just, you know, fix these two points, but this is P. This is just a, a, a dilation centered at those points, right? Okay, so everything is very explicit here. Now I want to define this, this set. So what I do is the following. So my surface sigma, of course, divides S3 into two connected components. So let me denote these connected components by A and A star. Connected components. So let's say that here is A and here is A star. Then I denote by N the unit normal to sigma which points inside A star. So N is the unit normal to sigma pointing into A star, right? And then I apply my conformal transformations to these sets, right? So I denote by AV, for example, V is a vector in the unit ball. This is just the image of A under the conformal map FV. AV star is just the image of A star under the conformal map. FV. And then uh, the boundary of this guy, of course, sigma is the boundary of A, right? My original surface. I denote by sigma V just the boundary of this guy. So this is the boundary of AV, which is the same as applying the map FV to sigma. Right. So given my original surface sigma, I get all these uh, conformal images, which, of course, the Wilmore energy of all of those guys is just equal to the Wilmore energy of, of sigma. So these guys, they are smooth surfaces inside S3. Uh, but, but so far, I just have four parameters, right? Because V lives inside the ball before. So I need to introduce a fifth parameter, 
And this is parallel translation in the normal direction. So what I do is the following. So I have this surface of sigma v, right, sitting inside the three sphere. And I look at the distance function to sigma v with a sign. I put a positive sign up here and a negative sign up, up you know, down there. So dv of x is just the distance of x to the surface if x is not in AV. Remember that AV is the component down there. And this is going to be minus the distance if x belongs to AV. So this is the signed distance function. So what we can see is that, of course, this is a Lipschitz function. And because uh, I'm, I'm using the sign, it's actually smooth in a neighborhood of, in a neighborhood of sigma v. Smooth in a neighborhood of sigma v. Okay, so now I look at the level sets of this function. This is going to give, the, give me the fifth parameter that I need. So the canonical family uh, is defined in the following in the following way. So you define sigma of v t. So remember, v is a vector in the unit ball, and t is going to be a parameter which lives in the interval minus pi to pi. That's the distance. Right, so I have first I take the conformal image, then I look at the equidistant surfaces uh, to sigma v. So the definition is this guy is just the boundary of an open set where this open set is just the the sublevel set of the distance function. This is the set of points in the three sphere such that dv of x is less than t. Right. Okay, so so this is canonical, right? Conformal and parallel uh, translations. So uh, of course here I also have a normal vector n v, right? Which I can just define as being the image of the normal vector n under the derivative of f v. So. All these surfaces have a, a canonical orientation given by this normal vector. And, uh, and I can check for it. So this is, this is a set, right? This is a topological boundary of an open set. So uh, the first remark is this is actually a rectifiable set. So if you look at the following map, C of VT defined on the surface. This is a smooth map into S3 in the following way. So this is the map that is going to start at, v, at, a, at, a, at a point on the surface, and you're going to uh, go distance t in the normal direction. Uh, so applied to a point y on the surface, I get the exponential map at y applied to t times the normal vector. Right. So because this is a sphere, right? This is, a, this is very explicit. The exponential map will give me just uh, cosine of t times y plus sine of t times the normal. Okay? This, this is just uh, the spherical, spherical geometry. This is a geodesic, right, in the three sphere. So then it's easy to see that this set sigma vt is contained in the image of this map. Right? Because every point of this boundary is at distance, let's say, absolute value of t, right, in the right direction of the, of the surface sigma v. So this is contained in the image of t. And actually, since you can always uh, pick a minimizing geodesic, so, so it's not a focal point there, you can actually take the image of the set of points where the Jacobian 
is no negative. Right? So this just means that the so this is the set of points where you don't get so the, the exponential uh, is non singular, right? Up up until time up until time t. So because this is a smooth map, this is a rectifiable subset, we conclude that sigma vt is a two rectifiable subset of S3. So rectifiable subset is a, a set which can be obtained as union of images of Lipschitz maps up to something which has area zero. So sigma vt is a rectif two rectifiable subset of S3. So not necessarily smooth, right? OK, so this is our family. Uh, just some remarks. So of course, uh, a v0. If the parameter is zero, I just get a v again. If I go distance pi uh, on the positive side, I get the whole sphere. Right? So that's why I run the parameter in the interval minus pi pi to make sure that I get everything. Right? So a of v pi is just the whole sphere. And you can see that if you go uh, minus pi in the negative direction, you get the empty set. Right. So in the three sphere, it's not possible to have a point and a surface with distance pi, right? Because otherwise, the surface would be just the antipodal point. So that is what you're using for that plane, Which the last line in that graph. So why, why a point cannot be always conjugate? It's because of what you said. What did they say? So, so why? Why, why is true? That yeah, so, so here you pick a, you pick a minimizing, you, pick, you, you realize the distance, right? So the, for each point here, there is a point in the sigma v which realizes the distance. Maybe so that is also, even being minimizing. Yeah, yeah, so here I allow greater than or equal to zero, right? So, so the only thing that matters to ah, me okay. is that there's nothing before, right? Ah, okay. Right. But you can take even bigger, right? Bigger, uh, maybe. Well, I guess maybe depends on the geometry of the surface, but anyway, it's not going to really matter, uh, right? So there's nothing at distance pi. So if you take the boundary, of course, sigma v zero is just sigma v, right? Uh, sigma v pi is going to be the empty set, right? The topological boundary of S3, and sigma v minus pi is just the empty set. So if you go up to pi both in the positive and the negative directions, you get you get nothing. Okay, uh, right. So now the idea is to we would like to estimate the area of sigma v t. Like that. Okay, so this is uh, was it follows from a calculation that is in the work of Antonio Ross. So let me just indicate how it goes. So the idea is that you need to compute. The idea is that I'm going to compute the Jacobian of this map, right? C of V T. Um, so you pick. Um, you pick an orthonormal basis of the tangent space at a, at a given point. So I can, I can choose this, this basis so that it diagonalizes the derivative of the normal map. So in this case, I get that the derivative of the normal, va normal map in Y applied to EI is just minus the principal curvature. Uh, these are the principal curvatures of the surface sigma v. Right? Then the Jacobi is just the product, right? So you compute the Jacobian of this map at the point y. This gives me, well, you have to differentiate this guy, right? 
So, so if I differentiate this guy in the direction e i, I get uh, cosine of t uh, minus sine of t k times k i. Sorry, k one, and I take the product with uh, cosine of t minus sine of t k two of the. That's the Jacobian, right? Just the product of the this eigenvalues there. Uh, okay, you expand this out, you get cosine square of t minus the sum of the principal curvatures times cosine of t sine of t, and you get plus the product <laughs> sine of t square. Then the lemma is that can actually check that this Jacobian is going to be equal to the following expression, 1 plus h square. Here is everything with respect to the surface sigma v, right? So here, here's the mean curvature of sigma v. That's the integrand of the humor energy. Then you get some corrections, but the, the corrections are negative. So you get minus sine of t plus h of v cosine of t squared minus k1 of v minus k2 of v squared divided by 4 sine square of t. Okay? This is just rearranging terms. So the area estimate is the following. So this is one can find in the paper of Ross, right? 1999. So he doesn't write it this way because for, he doesn't look at, he doesn't consider the family in its whole, right? he, but he looks at the fixed, a fixed surface sigma, then you look at the parallel surfaces, you can compute this. This actually follows from older stuff, Heights and Cartier, maybe even older. Yeah, no comparison. But Ross, you know, realized that this sort of area estimate could be important for the for the Wilmer problem. So the area estimate is the following. Well, I just integrate this Jacobian. So the area of the surface of this rectifiable set is going to be, at most, uh, the area of this image. right? So the area estimate that you get is the following, um, that the area of sigma vt is always less than or equal to the Wilmer energy of sigma minus sine square of t divided by 2 integral of the sec fundamental form square without a trace. The proof is just simple. You just combine everything that I said. So the area of sigma vt this in general is going to be less than or equal to the integral of the absolute value of the Jacobian, right? But I just look at the set of the Jacobian is non negative. So this is going to be less than or equal to the integral of the Jacobian of this guy over the set of points where the Jacobian is non negative. Then the, the estimate just follows from what I from what I wrote down. So this is going to be, of course, this set is contained in the, in, in the surface sigma v, right? So I get integral of sigma v of this expression here. So I can forget about this term, which is negative, and just consider the, the other one, which is... And this is equal to that. So this is the area estimate. This, this will be important later. This will be important later to, to consider the rigidity case. OK, so, so the important point here is that we have this five-parameter family of rectifiable subsets such that the area of each guy is bounded naturally by the, by the Wilmer energy of the original surface. 
So, so our idea was, okay, so let's apply Minimax to this family and see what we can prove. But so far, this is a family defined only uh, for, this is defined for, again, for V in the unit ball and T going from minus pi to, to pi. So we need to analyze what happens to the family as V goes to the boundary. This is an open set. So in order to do Minimax, we need a family defined in a compact set. Sorry? Here you said you took sigma and sigma v. This guy is contained in sigma v, right? So here's sigma v also. Everything sigma v. Okay, so, so what we need to do now is to, we need to analyze what happens to, to this family as we go to the boundary. We want to analyze uh, AVT, sigma VT, the boundary, as V goes to the boundary. Okay. So here's the notation. So the idea is that as, as you go to the boundary, the surfaces will converge uh, to geodesic spheres, right? But the surfaces have genus. So in what sense do they converge to geodesic spheres? So they converge in the sense of currents, which roughly speaking here in this sense, what, what we're going to prove is that as V goes to the boundary, uh, there is a geodesic sphere so that if you count the volumes between your surfaces and, and such geodesic spheres, these volumes go to zero. So, uh, so the notation is, we denote by uh, x, y, the symmetric difference, as in set theory. This is just the symmetric. Difference between these two sets. And I want to consider the following, uh, the following situation. I want to consider the, the case in which I have a sequence of Vn's in the unit ball, a sequence of Tn's in the interval minus pi pi, such that these guys converge to some point Vt, which is in the closure. So the first proposition, the easiest case to analyze is when the limit is in the interior of the ball, right? Because then uh, basically nothing happens. So if the, if V goes to the, if the limit point is in the interior, then you just get the usual conversion, right? right. So you can prove that the limit as N goes to infinity of the volume of the symmetric difference between this open set, VNTN, and the open set that you get in the limit is equal to zero, right? So basically your surface is sigma, because V is in the interior, the convergence is smooth, actually. So your surface is sigma VN are just converging smoothly to my surface sigma V. It's more or less obvious then that if you look at the sublevel sets of the distance function, right, of this, these two guys, the volumes are going to are going to go to zero. Hmm? What? No, no. I mean, I, I mean that these volumes go to zero. Yeah. So if Vn converts to V in the interior, sigma Vn converts to, to sigma V smoothly. Now, you can write it as a graph, and the graph goes to zero in any topology that you like. Implies the house of distance, yeah. It converts in whatever sense, whatever sense you want. Uh, 
right? So, so, so this is, is somehow the, the easy case, right? So what, what I'm saying is that this, this is a family defined for, for V in the, B4, in, in the unipole, right? And I have this parameter, which goes from pi to minus pi. And I'm, I'm analyzing the continuity of this family in the sense, the sense of volumes. What I'm saying is that in the interior, I have no problem. Right? The, here I get convergence in the sense of volumes. The, th the, the point is that what, what, what we get if we go to the boundary. So let me skip this and go to the more interesting case. So for example, so the second case now is if, if the limit point is in the boundary of S3, right? Then there are three cases. It could be on the surface sigma, it could be on the component A star, or it could be on the component A. So we have to analyze case by case. So the proposition is that if V is in the component A, which is the, in my picture, was the component downstairs, right? Then, uh, in, in the sense of volumes, if I look at the volume of the symmetric difference between my open set and the ball of radius pi plus t centered at V, so this is a geodesic ball in S3, then this limit goes to zero. So that's the, the, the proposition if V goes to, if v goes to A. Uh, let's see. So let me just write down again what happens if V is in A star. So let me just find it. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, this is, this is just the point, yeah. So if V is an A star, which is the component upstairs, uh, one can prove that the limit as N goes to infinity of the volumes of A, V, N, T, N, symmetric difference, then it, one gets the ball of radius T centered at minus V. This is going to zero. Again, this, this is geodesic, geodesic ball. Um, so let's see. So let me write down what happens in the interesting case. So the interesting case is when V goes to the surface sigma, right? That's the interesting case. And then we see what we can, what I can prove. I just worried a little bit about the time. Let's go. Hmm? I'll, I'll draw a picture in a, in a little bit, in some minutes. So the idea is that these conformal maps are sort of dilating your sigma, right? So, so if you're, forget about t, let's say t is zero. If t is zero, you get your surface sigma here. We just, sorry, you, you get sigma. We're just looking at conformal maps here. So if the, so if the point, if you take like a sequence of V's converge to a point P, Vn converge to this point P over sigma, and I apply the conformal maps, right? The image of the surface sigma is going to go to minus P. Right, if the surface sigma is not in P. Actually, uh, I'm looking at the actual open set, right? So the open set goes to minus p. So the other situation, this is a situation where p is in a star, right? So the other situation is when p is in a down here. Then what happens is again, uh, the surface sigma is going to minus p, but now the open set covers the whole thing, right? Since this guy is going to be sent into the whole OS3. So that's the situation where you get when t is equal to 0, you get a ball of radius pi. So this is, uh, uh, this is what happens always. So the issue, the interesting issue, is what happens if the point P lives in sigma. Then the answer is going to depend on the angle of the convergence of the sequence. Right? Is it clear what I mean, more or less? 
So this is what happens when t is equal to zero, of course, then the parameter t just corresponds to, a, to a, a, an equidistant surface. Okay, so uh, let me give you the answer. So what happens when p goes to, goes to the, what happens if vn converts to v, which is equal to some point p on the surface? So let me introduce some, some notation. So I have this p here, right? I can look at the normal direction n of p. So imagine that I'm cutting uh, my ball with a disk here containing p and with this by passing through the normal direction. So somehow this is b4, right? And I have the origin here. So what I want to do is I want to consider a tubular neighborhood of my surface sigma inside the unit ball, and I want to construct the parametrization of that. So here's the way we do it. So we define a map lambda, which goes from a point over the surface sigma, and a two-dimensional disk in the positive half plane, let's say of radius 3 epsilon. Epsilon is going to be a small number into the ball. And the definition is the following. Define this map by lambda of p comma s is just 1 minus s1 times cosine of s2 times p plus sine of s2 times the normal of p. Okay, so uh, what I'm doing is just I'm parametrizing a tubular neighborhood of the surface sigma inside the unit ball. So D2 of plus R just denotes the set of points in the plane with norm less than R. And such that the first coordinate is positive, no negative. Right? And what I'm doing then is to, I look at the, this disk of radius 3 epsilon. This is the boundary. This is the disk of radius 3 epsilon. And here's the, my point on the 3 sphere, right? This is the 3 sphere S3. So what am I doing is that if I, if I, if I walk along this vertical direction here, I'm just running... No, I'm going along the geodesic here. Geodesic which has velocity vector normal of p, right? This corresponds to the parameter s2. Uh, and then the parameter s1 just project, you know, just goes into radially with respect to the origin here. So that's the, that's the diffeomorphism, right? So if epsilon is small, lambda is actually a different morphism onto a tubular neighborhood of sigma in B4. So lambda is a different morphism onto a tubular neighborhood of sigma in B4. Okay. Uh, so let me introduce some notation. I'll, I'll denote this tubular neighborhood by omega. So this depends on the radius. Omega r is going to be the image of this product. Right. That's the tubular neighborhood of radius r. Sorry. Lambda is a diffeo onto a tubular neighborhood of sigma in V4. Tubular neighborhood. Okay, so uh, so now the idea is that w we have a sequence of v's which convert to p, right? Maybe I should use a different color. I'm analyzing the case where the points v n convert to a point p over the surface. So now what I I'm, I'm going to use the the coordinates that I just described uh, to explain what's going to to happen. So the idea is the following. So we're going to compute explicitly what's the limit. So here's, again, some, some notation. 
Maybe I should put this notation separately because maybe we'll need it later. Maybe I should erase this by now. So P is a point over the surface, right? K is going to be a number between minus infinity and infinity, including, including the infinities there. Then you define R bar K to be pi over 2 minus the arctangent of K. This is going to be a number between 0 and pi. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to tell exactly what is the center and what is the radius of the geodesic ball that you get in the limit. And you, de you define Q bar PK to be the following vector, minus K uh, square root of 1 plus K square times P minus 1 divided by square root of 1 plus K square norm of P. in S3. So this is, a, of course, this is a vector in S3, right? Uh, and one can see that if I look at the geodesic, this is a remark, if I look at the geodesic ball of radius little r k centered at this point, this is going to be this, the same as taking the Euclidean ball of radius, capital R K and intersect with the three sphere, where the capital R is given by this number. So you can work with you can look at a geodesic ball as an intersection with of S3 with some Euclidean ball, or you can define it intrinsically. That's the way of going from one radius uh, to, the, to the other. That's very useful to compute uh, conformal, conformal images. So now the, the idea is the following. We have a sequence of Vns converging to P. So now eventually they they're going to fall into the image of this of this diffeomorphism. So I can use the S1 and S2 coordinates to to write uh, Vn as some image of some point Pn with some coordinates, let's say S and 1 and S and 2. Right? Where Pn is a point on the surface. This is just the closest point on the surface to Vn, right? And they are necessarily have to convert to P, right? Pn converts to P. So let me just draw a picture. So here corresponds to Pn. I have then in the S1, S2 coordinates, I have this point Vn, which is converging to, which is close to Pn, right? Then I can measure these two numbers. This is S and 1, and this is S and 2, right? And K, K, K is going to be just the limit of the ratio between these two numbers. So that's, that's how I measure the angle, right? So if I, if I denote the angle by, by, by theta, in the limit, uh, the tangent of theta is going to be So assume this. Assume that your sequence of Vs converge to the point P along some angle, right? So here's how to measure the angle, right? You can you can look at the tangent, for example, the angle. This is this is k. That's the number that I'm going to to put over here. So the claim then is that preposition again. Uh, in the sense of, of volumes, if I look at the volume of this symmetric difference with the ball of radius little r plus t, 
centered at that point, this goes to zero. So in the volume sense, the sets are getting closer and closer to this, to this geodesic ball. And you get all kinds of limits, right? Uh, they all converge to the same point, but depending on the angle, you get different uh, centers and different, different radii. Sorry? The angles, not fixed. No, no, some number which converges. Yeah, yeah, but I, I'm assuming that it converges, right? So you can always pass to a subsequence so that the angle converges. That's why I allow minus infinity and infinity here. Okay, so I'm assuming that the angle converges, and the limit would depend on this angle. So let me sit situate myself because I skipped. A couple of things. So let me indicate how how to prove this. Okay. So you only the subsequence is the important thing, not the, the fact that the, the whole limit exists. No, if you take an arbitrary sequence, maybe it oscillates, as you say, right? But if you assume it doesn't oscillate, then it has a limit. That's what I'm saying. I'm going to explain how to, how to handle that in a minute, okay? So the point here, so far the point is just that the, the limit depends on the angle and it can compute explicitly what it is. So you can draw a picture, I'm just, maybe you should summarize the situation here of the limits, so summarizing. I get that A, V, N, T, N converts to A, V, T if V is in the interior, is in the open unit ball. This goes to the ball of radius. Here it converges in the sense of volumes, right? As I just explained. Right, plus T times V if V is in A. This guy converge to this ball if V is an A star. And finally, this is case one, two, three. Finally, the fourth case, one can prove that these guys converge to the ball, to this ball. If I assume that the point V is on the surface, and I have this. Con if I assume that the angles converge, so this describes completely what happens uh, in the limit. Um, and let me just draw a picture of what what is going on with the spheres. So if you if you if you try to understand what what what, are, what these spheres are doing, the first thing you see is that. Uh, minus p is always is on, on the boundary of all of these guys. So the picture is something like this. Here's minus p. Here's p. Uh, this is the ball when k, the boundary of the ball when k is equal to zero. Then you have these spheres like that. They all pass through minus p. So this is when here is k go, going to minus infinity. Here is k going to plus infinity. So these are the the balls that you find in the limit. Uh, and of course, this is the direction n of p, right? Okay. So that was the first discovery, right? So we discovered that the act, the, the limits can be computed if you allow for this. Angle thing. So the question is, how how do you how do we uh, fix this problem? How how do we compute this? Let me indicate how we compute these limits. Let me just situate my, myself here in these notes. These notes are too organized for myself. <laughs> so so the idea is the following. Okay. So 
Okay, so how do we uh, prove this? We just indicate. We have to compute conformal images of balls. So we have this surface which has genus G. So we pick a point P, right, which is the point where we have the limit. So this surface might have like arbitrarily high genus, right? But there is one uh, great sphere which passes through P and has the same tangent plane. So basically what you have to, to, to prove is that the limit that you get for your surface is the same limit that you get for the, for the sphere uh, with the same tangent plane. So the idea is to prove the following. Suppose that you have, so here we are, we have to compute conformal images of balls and sectors. And this is in one of the appendices of the, of the paper. So suppose that you have two vectors P and N in the three sphere, which are orthogonal. Like here, you can look at a point on the surface and the normal vector to the surface at that point. We can look at the following sector. So I draw the three sphere like here. So here's the point P. I have the direction N. So I go distance R from a point P in the positive direction like here. And I, and I subtract the sphere centered at that point, right, such that P is on the boundary. I do the same in the negative direction here. This is distance R. I subtract this guy. And I want to look at the sector, right, the complement of these two, two balls. So the sector is defined like this, P and R. It's just S3 minus the ball of radius R centered at cosine of R P plus sine of R normal union the ball radius R cosine of R P minus sine of R N. So this is the, the sector. It's also useful to compute, as I say, conformal images of balls. So let me do another picture. So here's P, here's N. So I, could, I can take minus n over here, which is in the three sphere corresponds to this point, and I can look at this, this ball of radius pi over 2. So I can see this as the ball of radius pi over 2 centered at minus n, or I can also view it as the Euclidean ball of radius the square root of 2 minus, centered at minus n intersected with S3. Right just for convenience, the calculations. OK. So what we prove in the appendix, in the appendix is the following. We prove the following thing in the appendix. Appendix B, actually, that if you take a vector V, which is in this form, 1 minus S times cosine T times P, P plus sine of T times N, S and T I can choose to be small, no problem, because my, my sequence is converging to the boundary. Then we prove that the image under the, my conformal map of the sector delta P and R is contained in a very small annulus. So here's the annulus. This is contained. Look at the Euclidean ball of radius R plus, plus some small quantity, which is measured in terms of the square root of the norm of ST, centered at Q bar, minus a ball of same radius but centered at R bar minus this quantity. Where this point Q bar is just 
minus t over s divided by square root of 1 plus t of s square. So this is a, uh, you know, takes some work, but it's everything very explicit. Times m. This is the center of the ball, and the radius is just square root of 2 times 1 minus t over s square root of 1 plus. Okay. So this is just a, a statement about conformal transformations of Euclidean space. You can see uh, from that, you know, why then I have these expressions, right? The idea is that k is going to be t divided by s, right? In my joy here, this is t and s. So that's how we get those expressions over there, because we prove this, including the radius, right? I have a similar expression for the radius here. Uh, and also, we can prove the image. We can also compute the image of this, of this ball, uh, uh, just for completeness. Let me write down. So we can prove that the image of the ball of radius pi over two. contains uh, this ball and is containing the other ball. And it's contained here. Okay. So, so this is, as I said, is just about conformal transformations applied to balls and sectors. So, how do we compute the images of the surface then? So, let me draw a picture to explain. The idea is, is the following: I, I, I need to compute uh, the those sets uh, in terms of volumes, right? So, the idea is the following. Suppose this is my point P n. And suppose this is my surface sigma, which passes through Pn. And suppose this guy is the boundary. Uh, so here is my normal, right? At Pn. Then I can write down the boundary of the ball of center that minus the normal square root of 2 intersected with S3. This, I, I'm going to denote this by BPN. This is a ball of radius pi over 2 in the 3 sphere. And the boundary of this ball is exactly the, the tangent sphere, the, the great sphere which is tangent to the surface at the point, at the point PN. Uh, so BPN is, let's say, BPN is what I, what I have below uh, that sphere. But I also have my set A, which is what I what I have below the surface sigma, right? So here's A, and, and here's A star. So the point is that if I look at the symmetric difference between my set A and this ball, right, I can choose, I can choose a ball here of radius R naught like this, very, very small. So this is a ball of radius R naught. And I can do the same on the negative side here, right? Also, radius are not. So that if I subtract these two balls, uh, the complement is exactly uh, a sector like this, right? So the idea is that if I look at the symmetric difference between what I have below sigma and what I have below the, the ball, this guy is contained in the sector, right? Because uh, if a point is in A, it's below sigma, so it cannot be in the ball upstairs. But if it's not uh, in this ball, then it's not also in the ball downstairs, and, re and, and reciprocally. Pn is, not P. PN is convergent to P, right? Might be P, Might be P yeah. No, 
Now, I'm doing the balls with radius normal at Pn. Right? P could be any point, so I just choose to be on Pn. <coughs> right? Yeah. Everything's Pn. Around n of Pn with radius R0. This, this ball? In yeah, it's not centered in Pn. Yeah, it's centered in, in a point like this. Uh -huh. With Pn, this is what this is. yeah, center at this point. You 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 will go a little, you go a little upstairs. Take this ball and do the same on the other side. Okay. So I, I can choose R not very small so that this ball is on the sides of both surfaces. So you, so you is it trivial to to check that these two centers are different. What centers? Here is plus, here is minus, right? And R is very small. It's just like the picture. We go a little bit up, a little bit down. OK, so we know that the symmetric difference is contained in the sector. Then if we apply our conformal transformation FVN right, to this guy, of course, the image will respect the symmetric differences. This is going to be contained in the image of the conformal Im image of the sector. But because of this calculation, right, as S and T goes to zero, which corresponds to Vn converge to the point P, right, this, this norm gets smaller and smaller. So the, the volume of this annulus goes to zero. And, and the image of the sector has to be contained in this annulus. So this. Uh, than the volume of this symmetric difference has to be less than or equal to the volume of this guy. But this volume is going to zero, right? So what, uh, the, our conclusion is that the image of the conformal transformations of our open sets in the limit is just the same as you would get if you replace your surface sigma by the great sphere of tangent to the surface at that point. And then you use you know, explicit calculations. Here's the formula. You can compute you what's happening there. Yeah, I mean, we get an estimate because if we, this is, depends on the square root of st, right? So you can just get an estimate. But the point is that this is going to 0. That's all that, that's all that matters for our construction. OK, so, so then we, we've seen that our surface is not continuous. Our, our family is not continuous as v goes to the boundary, right? Because the limit in the fourth case is dependent on an angle. But here's the way we fix it. The point is that it depends only on the angle. Right? That's what we, I proved with this argument. So then we can do a blow-up argument, blow-up construction, which is the following. So I'm going to use the different morphism lambda as a way of writing my tubular neighborhood. So here's the picture. Here's my point P. Um, some, I got something like this. Right. Uh, so here outside is the ball minus omega 3 epsilon. Remember that omega r is the tubular neighborhood radius r. And here inside this disk, is my omega epsilon, right? So distance epsilon, two epsilon, and three epsilon in the normal normal plane. So you choose a function phi that does the following. There's zero here, smooth function, right? It's one over here and is increasing here. Any function phi with those properties would do the job. Then you construct the following, construct a map T which goes from the ball to the ball by the following search that, well, I want, I want my map to be the identity outside the tubular neighborhood of radius 3 epsilon. And inside the tubular neighborhood of tubular neighborhood of radius 3 epsilon, I can use lambda 
my diffeomorphism, so I, I, I can assume that my point here is the image under lambda of some guy like this, PS. And then what I do is I take S, which is a vector in the disk, and I just multiply by phi of the norm of S, right? Not very complicated. <coughs> phi is a function of, of, a, of a real variable, so I put the norm of S here. So here's my radio map. And the remark is that if I am inside omega epsilon, my function phi will be zero there, right? So the map T collapses this whole tubular neighborhood onto the point P, but radially. So the remark is that T collapses omega epsilon onto the surface, because remember that this is happening uh, over the whole surface, right? Onto sigma. Radially, and now the idea is that now, sort of the idea is that we want to fix our family of surfaces, so I want to define C, my, a new family C of VT, as being sigma of capital T of VT. So I use the map T to reparameterize my family. All right. Let me put under quotes because uh, <clears throat> I want to interpret this as a current. So now, if I if I do this, if you take a sequence of V ends now, which converge to a point here on the boundary, right? And if I look at C V N T. Right? This is just sigma t of v n t. Well, remember that t collapses everything here onto the point p, but collapses radially, so the angle is preserved. Right? So if v n converts to this point over here, my sequence t of v n is going to converge to p with an angle. Right? So then this is going to converge to some, some geodesic sphere. Some explicit geodesic sphere. One of those. One of those depending on the angle. So all these geodesic spheres appear as, as limits over the over this set. So for each point here I get some geodesic sphere. Now, since I want to extend my family to the whole ball, you can just, you know, you can just extend it so that it's constant on horizontal lines. You can pick the sphere here and define this, your family to be the same over horizontal lines. So now your family is defined on the whole thing, and such that over the three sphere and inside this small tubular neighborhood, all we get are geodesic spheres. Okay. Um, so here we have a choice to make because I kind of underestimated the time. Yeah. Is it at this point that you have to use variables and not currents? No, no. This is in the sense of currents. So we need to use varifolds because freezes of the mean max, they converge to minimal surface in the sense of, of varifolds. Oriented surfaces, yeah, oriented surfaces. So currents are oriented objects, right? So the idea is that if the volume goes to zero, the, you have convergence in the sense of currents. So if I interpret this guy as a current, I get a continuous, a continuous family. It doesn't converge in the sense of varifolds. So what's your example? So are you thinking about, let's see, something like this, right? Uh, let's see, something like this. Okay, so the volume, so that collapses down, you get a sphere, 
zero. Right. So this converts to zero in the sense of current. So it goes to zero. You don't want it zero. You want to get no, no, no. But, but in this case, you don't get the convergence to the, to the sphere in the sense of current. You get converged to zero. Because this guy bounds something which has volume going to zero, right? That's why it's really zero. Yeah, so in this sense it goes to zero. In, in this picture it goes to zero. So that can't yeah, it can happen because... It could be the point, yeah. Ah, okay. could be a point. Yeah, so, so this picture is not what's going on here. So in, in, the, in this family, right? So if your surface here, I mean the volume in between those two guys, right? So something like this the volume is going to zero here. This is not what's going on here. I don't, the volume is not going to zero here. Because here, you know, it bounds a whole, has lots of volume here, right? right. Yeah, so, so the original family is only continuous in the sense of currents, not, not variables. Okay, so let's say, let's say we have maybe 10 or 10 minutes maybe. So we have a choice to make. Either I do the degree argument, or I try to interpret this as currents and just produce some notation to continue next time. Uh, so, so maybe I should do the currents things just to, yeah. So later in one of the, you know, in a, in another talk, I'll talk about the degree argument. Because the degree argument is a calculation, which follows from the gauss bonnet theorem. So uh, in order to make this whole thing rigorous, right, because this convergence is all in the sense of volumes, we need to talk about geometric measure theory. So we're going to interpret these surfaces in a weak sense. Uh, so here's uh, some notation. So if you have, suppose you have some three-dimensional Riemannian manifold, orientable, for example, Riemannian three-manifold, uh, we can always assume that M is isometrically contained in some Euclidean space. It doesn't, doesn't really matter, but just to help the definitions. So we denote by IK of M the space of k-dimensional integral currents. In RL, uh, with support contained in the manifold. So a current, of course, is, uh, is like a distribution, right? So distribution acts on functions. Uh, current acts on differential forms. So the idea is that a current is something that you can integrate differential forms on. Uh, but the word integral means something more, more explicit. So an integral current is, uh, you can think of this as a k-dimensional uh, rectifiable subset which comes with a tangent space almost everywhere with integer multiplicities <coughs> so you allow multiplicities here but they have to be integer numbers so you can do for example uh, one you can you can think of for example if this is s1 this is s2 you can think of s1 minus s2 as a current um, and, and orientations. Chosen almost everywhere. So you can think of you know, small pieces of surfaces with orientation. If you have an object like that and you have a K, a differential K form, of course, because of the orientation, you can integrate the K differential form over, over your, your object. So they act on differential forms by integration. And so currents are oriented objects, and there is a natural notion of boundary. There's a natural notion of boundary. You define the boundary of your current to act on a differential form by the following formula. Right? This is the boundary, the boundary of, uh, 
of a current, and actually integral current, you actually ask for the bounded to be rectifiable as well. So for example, my set sigma vt can be thought of as integral current. Then you define uh, zk of m to be the space of cycles, which is just the space of currents, integral currents, with boundary 0. Right. Those are the currents that are interesting to me. For example, a closed surface is an example of a two current. And you can define the mass of a current. The mass should be thought of a, 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 the area with multiplicities. So here's the definition. You can look at the soup of T applied to phi, where phi is any uh, differential form in the Euclidean space with compact support, and norm of phi is less than 1. So this is the area counted with multiplicities. Uh, OK, so, so, so the mass, so this is a a norm, right, in the space of current. So you also define m of s1, comma s2 to be the mass of the difference of these two currents. But this, in order for, for two currents to be very close in the mass norm, it's a very strong condition, right? So, for example, if you have a current like this, s1, and another one like this, they are not close in the mass norm because if you take if you subtract one from the other the currents are still there so the mass of the difference because they are disjoint is going to be just the sum of the sum of the masses so for for, for something to be close in the mass norm it has to be something like this you know you take this to be s1 then you change it just a little bit these are close in the mass norm <laughs> but anyway so for this the first talk it's more convenient to look at the flat norm. So the, the flat metric. So the flat metric is just, this is one which measures the volumes, right? The definition is the following. You look at the infimum. You write down your difference as P plus the boundary of Q. So this is a K current. Let's say this is a K current. So P is going to be a K current but Q is going to be a K plus 1 current. And then you take the infimum of the mass of P plus the mass of Q over all the possible expressions. So for example, if the currents are close in the volume sense, which is the sense that I'm talking about since the beginning, I can write down the difference as the boundary of something which has very small mass. So this means that the flat distance between these two currents is going to zero, right? Yeah. The way you are measuring the volume is in a three-dimensional way. So you take the difference, you compute the volume in a three. Yeah. But this mass is in a two-dimensional sense. If you if you think about surfaces. Right? This is because about this is two-dimensional, but this will be three-dimensional, right? Because I I, I forgot I I. I there's no boundary here. Yeah, well, I was talking about the mass. Uh huh. Uh, okay. Right. So forget about p. So let's say p is zero. If you write a two surface as the boundary of a three-dimensional guy, I'm looking at the three-dimensional volume here. Right. This, this, this is what flat flat distance means. Okay. So this is why you want to consider all the possible. Yeah. OK, so, so I'll finish in five minutes. So I'm just write down, collect all this information in relation to what I've done to state a, a theorem. Maybe I should keep this. Uh, see. So that's the flat distance, right? So of course, the, I can define the flat, flat of t to be just flat the distance from the zero current, and this is always less than the mass of t by, by just the definition. You can make q equal to zero. And a final piece of notation, if you have an open set 
of your manifold with finite perimeter, you can think of this open set as an integral current. Because it, and that, that's the notation. I'll do like this. This is the current associated with my open set. This is a this is acts on on differential forms, right? In this case, on three dimensional, on three forms, just by integrating omega over u. So here's the the theorem. The theorem. And I'm going to, to end with this. So the says the following. The map below that I'm going to define is well defined and continuous in the flat topology. Here's the map. I'm just going to formalize and you know, make it rigorous what I Vote here. You take C. Now my map is going to be defined on the whole ball, on the closure of the ball. And my objects will be not only integral currents, but will be integral currents with boundary zero. Because remember, the sigma VT was, was already a boundary, right? So the boundary of a boundary is zero. So there are going to be two cycles in S3, defined in the following way. So it, 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 C of VT is going to be if V is outside the omega epsilon region, remember the picture. Right? I had P omega epsilon and I, have, and I had the outside. So if V is inside here, I just take uh, I look at the open set. Now, reparameterize my family. Uh, this is an open set, so I can look at the current associated to this open set. So now this is an integral current, and I can take the boundary of this current. Okay, so now this is, a, this is an integral two current with boundary zero. And if it's not, you define this as the boundary of the falling current, which is the ball of radius r plus V plus T, centered at Q bar V. The boundary of this current, if V is, well, if V is either on the three sphere, right, or inside the omega epsilon region. So here, just to finish, Q bar, so what is Q bar, right? So Q bar is a function defined has to be defined in that region, S3 union omega epsilon, gives me a point in S3, is such that, so Q bar of V is equal to, well, if I am in A star, I put minus T of V, if V is in A star. Uh, if I am in E, I put T of V, So this is the center of the ball. And this is going to be Q bar PK if V is in the region. And I can write V, if I take V over here, right? I can write V as lambda PS. But I said that I, want, I will extend my, my, my surface so that it is constant in horizontal lines. So I, I, the image, the, the surface here is going to be exactly the surface here, right? So the way I do this is just I write V as lambda of P S, and I have to say what what K is. So K is just S two divided by square root of. So K is exact. This K is just the the one corresponding oops, to this point here. So the, the spheres are constant over horizontal lines. And, and the radius is just, well, the radius is just and the radius uh, 
uh, 0 i, right, is given by the radius is going to be 0 if v is an a star is going to be pi if v is an a and it's going to be the, the radius that I wrote over there if v is omega a again where k is the same guy that I that I defined here so what, what I'm writing down is just I'm collecting all the information that I, that I got in the limits here right so I'm writing down all those limits but now remember applying the, my parametrization t of v and just writing down what I get in the limit so if you write if you, if you define your family like this because I, I just mentioned how to prove that these volumes in between these currents go to zero in the boundary, the, the, the resulting family is going to be continuous in the flat topology. Right. Uh, continu continuity in the flat topology implies continuity in the sense of currents because you know, if you have two currents like this and the volume is small, right? If you write down this guy's boundary of some Q and you apply this guy to some differential form, this is just the boundary applied to the differential form, but this is Q applied to the differential of omega, right? So because Q is small, the resulting guy will be, will be small as well. So if the volume is going to zero, they are converging as currents. Okay, so the proof is basically what I wrote down with some formalism. Of course, the mass of each one of these currents is going to be bounded by the Wilmore energy. Right? That's what Ross had proven. So next time, uh, I might explain the degree argument. Then I'll, I'll start talking about the, the Mimax theory and how to, you know. So I, I'm going to explain what is the Mimax theory of yeah, Elmgren and Pitts. What you said before, prove, prove this theory? Yeah. But you assume that the no, no, but if you converge to this guy, after I apply T, the angle will be fixed, right? So I, 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 I wrote, you know, I don't have this guy, like, if you converge to a point on the boundary of the circle, after I apply the radial map, they're going to converge to the point P with a fixed angle. It's not going to oscillate. Then I get a limit here over the sem semicircle. Then I extend it trivially by doing constant over horizontal lines. That's the, the idea. So we continue. More questions? More questions? Okay, so we are not going to applause you today. No problem. <laughs> We have two more. <laughs>